Hello and welcome to another episode of Steel Fur Speaks with, of course, me, uh, Steel Fur. Um, I guess this episode kind of blurs the line into the supremacy side of things as well, just because it's talking about uh, a competitive event. Um, I just wanted to give a quick update and provide my thoughts on the investigation outcome announcement that we had from LSS earlier today. So a nice sort of quick update just to give um, my overview and thoughts about that. And let's, why don't we have a quick read of that. Um, UK National Championships investigation outcome. So obviously they said they were investigating it to hold um, hold steady for future updates. Um, we can see now they have their updates. Uh, the UK National Championships took place over the last weekend. And for the most part, it was a great event. Definitely 100% true. Uh, we'd like to thank Living Realms. Did a fantastic job. Uh, the UK National Championship tournament organisers. Yeah, and the judge team for putting on an amazing event for all players that attended. That's entirely true. The event was fantastic. Um, I was there. It was so much fun. Subject to the event, however, several instances have of several instances involving player conduct. This is some typos, but that's okay. Uh, were brought to our attention, causing us to conduct an investigation into whether there had been a breach of the tournament rules and policy, specifically an issue with around one and eight matches involving the winner, Matthew Fawkes. And the investigation has concluded included the following a full review of gameplay and footage of the reported incidents you can see some of that in my own video on the controversy statements from the to head judge of various players um i know various people sent emails in i know the to and head judge had a call with lss so that's you know good investigation multiple meetings of the committee to discuss the above assess any potential infractions and agree on any potential sanctions um following the review the committee has made a finding among sport and sporting conduct in regard to the player observed in round one um, and has determined to issue a formal warning in regard to this instance. Specifically, an issue here was a play sequence where the player in question misses the timing window for a beneficial trigger to create an embodiment of Earth token then silently corrects the missed trigger. However, when their opponent misses an embodiment of lightning trigger on the next turn, they call a judge and their opponent and prevent them from creating the token. So this is exactly the moment at 55 minutes in the in the Saturday video that we reviewed during my video on the controversy that came out earlier this week. Um, and this is the part where we really, really did draw attention to the fact that he had, without consulting his opponent, um, correct his missed trigger um, outside the window while his opponent was blocking, which, to be fair, you could very easily call um, cheating. You could call it just a you know, missed trigger correction, that kind of thing. But then, of course, if he was to do that and the opponent didn't spot it or let him get away with it, then when his opponent did the same mistake on the next turn, he demonstrates that he is very clearly aware of the timing on the rules um, and prevents his opponent from doing it, whereas really he should be applying the same standard to his opponent as it is to himself. And LSS do acknowledge this. They say flesh and blood is a comp complicated game um, and there is often levels of tolerance amongst players when play sequences are not executed strictly in accordance with the rules. At professional level events, there is an expectation the rules will be followed and players are within their rights to require their opponent to sequence their actions accurately. However, even at this level of play, there is often a level of understanding between players that they will tolerate some deviations from the correct order of play in the spirit of having a good game. A good example of that is the tunic um, being used to pay for things and people not necessarily requiring you to announce your tunic trigger before you play a card and just you know play a card and say oh, i'm paying for it with tunic a lot of people just tolerate that shortcut and examples like that where the community tolerates these things in the spirit of having a good game and also just getting through things quite quickly and not slowing down for time loads of tiny little statements and, and interactions and those kind of things and there's also examples of stuff like that um with things like command and conquer and destroy your arsenal before your opponent has said oh you have to destroy your arsenal now that is actually kind of a gray area because of course some people would argue that if my opponent doesn't announce a trigger um then you know that comes and then we'll get back to that in a second um the finding of a sports unsporting conduct has been made because the player in question expected a level of leniency should be applied to inaccuracies in their play sequencing i.e ticking up the uh, ticking up the embodiment trigger um with when their opponent didn't um you know acknowledge it or you know if they had acknowledged it let that let it happen but fail to extend the same court courtesy to their opponent we expect the players will hold themselves to a higher standard of conduct at all time and his behaviors fell short of that standard so this is kind of interesting because essentially what they're saying is play uh, be treated as you expect to be treated um and it'll be interesting to see how judges take and apply this because if i allow my opponent to take back a pitch 
for example, and then I try and take back a pitch that I've done in the wrong order, um, you know, a judge could potentially use this precedent to say, actually, you let him do it to this standard, so therefore we're going to hold you to the same standard. And there are a lot of interesting rules in card games, specifically where it comes to the idea of, of agreed standards or agreed um, shortcuts, right? Um, you know, so for example, you know, if someone says, oh, I want to do this a hundred times and then tries to do it, um, you know, a hundred times by playing something out just to play for time, the judge will just say, okay, it happens a hundred times, you get X and it will get skipped. But also stuff like using tunic is often an agreed shortcut where we both know that I have to activate my tunic as an instant before I pick play a card and then try and use it for resources. But most people agree that using tunic as a shortcut um, actually just speeds up the game and doesn't really impact things. But um, I will say with Frostbite, obviously, you have to activate tunic, so it's important to sequence that properly. I'm not saying you shouldn't sequence cards properly. I'm just pointing out there are a lot of agreed shortcuts in the game that we both play with um, that become an accepted part of the rules. So, for example, if my opponent and I are playing and he uses tunic after playing a card and just says, oh, OK, I'll pay for it with tunic and I'll pitch this. And I say, OK, that's fine. Um, and then I turn around and try and do the same thing, and he says, that's not okay, then I can rightly probably call a judge and say, well, look, I extended this courtesy to my opponent. We were playing with that shortcut in place. He is not allowing me to do that. And the judge will correctly rule that I can use my tunic in the same way my opponent did, because as far as I was concerned, we were playing with that sequencing in mind. And the same thing applies to a lot of shortcuts in card games, like, for example, um, Chain and the Banish Zone with all the Blood Deck cards being kept separate from the regular Banish Zone. That is an agreed shortcut where both I and my opponent benefit by having that knowledge separate, and therefore it makes sense to separate the things out. And there was a bit of a kerfuffle, remember, about that because some people were saying that because Eclipse isn't a blood debt card, they didn't have to put it in the blood debt pile. And really all that matters in that situation is what does your opponent think that pile is for? When I'm sitting down against a chain player, I assume the pile that they have separate from their banished zone is every single card that is relevant um, within the game that isn't banished. So that means that all of their cards that have no interaction with the banished zone, like E-Strikes, Art of Wars, all that stuff can happily be banished. But if it's something like Eclipse, even though it doesn't have blood debt, I expect it to be in the relevant banished cards pile. Because I don't view that as a blood debt pile. And if my opponent doesn't agree to that, because I have to agree to what they're saying as well, then actually that pile has to go away, right? Because we both have to agree the shortcut that happens in the game in order for the game to progress with that shortcut in place. And that's kind of important. So when you are extending something to your opponent, whether it's, oh, I pitched this card a second ago, can I actually change it for a different card? And if you let them do it, and then you want to do it as well, you should be able to do it within the understanding of what LSS consider to be the spirit of having a good game. And that's kind of important. You know, it is important to have rules in the, the game that, that allow for the spirit of, of good gameplay. And, um, you know, obviously, if you're playing super tight, you shouldn't make mistakes with sequencing. You shouldn't have any issues with that. But if they do occur and they are resolved in an amicable way, they should continue to be resolved in that way um, for the rest of the game. And it's not to say that, you know, some things aren't bigger than others, you know, and maybe there are times when you want to say actually no. But really, I mean, at a high level of play, you shouldn't be allowing any take backs. Um, but for example, right, a common shortcut that I have seen and I do expect to continue is that if I am attacking with an Arcanic Shockwave and it deals one point of Arcane and damage, creating an embodiment of Earth exactly when the, the Arcane damage hits is accurate and, and specific. Um, however, lots of players do just create two embodiment tokens once their opponent has dealt with the damage. And that is created by another shortcut that the opponents often do, which is treating the arcane damage and the physical damage not in their appropriate sections, but blocking and dealing with the arcane out of order. So if you're in a situation where your opponent is dealing with arcane out of order, they cannot then object to you creating embodiment tokens out of order because they are creating a situation where the triggers are flexible and therefore your triggers also have to be flexible to match. So if your opponent says, oh, I'll block with this and then says, oh, actually, I'll pitch this for the arcane, you know, 
<laughs> and and then tries to complain later on in the game where you create embodiments that are separate token, you have a, one of these conflicts. Really, you would be justified in saying, actually, you've already blocked, therefore you can't pitch for the arcane. And that is important at a high level and probably what people are going to say. But there's this whole range um, of what we call acceptable shortcuts and sportsmanlike conduct that people are willing to tolerate. And I think one of the things that Flesh and Blood probably has to do as we move into these poor money competitive events is just get a lot tighter at not tolerating... Um, not tolerating leniency, I guess, and playing incredibly cleanly. Because the way you res you resolve all of these issues is just by sequencing properly and not allowing takebacks. Now, allowing takebacks is quite comfortable. I've said before, and I'm, I'm I don't mind my policy on this. Uh, to play by chess rules, um, whereby if their hand is still on the card, if they're halfway through doing something, if they haven't played it and we haven't started resolving it, they can change their mind. If they're halfway through saying, "Oh, I pitched this card," and they say, "Actually, wait, let me pitch this one." That's fine. It hasn't made it to the table. I, I don't care. Um, if I get free information, great. It is you know, it is what it is. Um, anyway, let's move on because I don't want this video to be too long. Uh, the committee also investigated the other instances of missed triggers that occurred, including in round eight. While it's unfortunate to see these kind of misplays happen, they are not necessarily rules violations in and of themselves. In these cases, so we're specifically talking about the pummel trigger that David Dyson played against Matt Fawkes. Um, in these cases, the active player themselves forgot about their own beneficial trigger, which can happen at the end of a long day of play. Uh, we address this issue further below without condoning the play that took place here. There is no conclusive evidence of intent with regards to these plays, and the committee has made no further findings on this basis. So if you hit with Pummel or Command and Conquer, you need to announce the trigger. Um, your opponent cannot be held responsible, um, and you cannot determine really whether their intent was to forget the trigger um, outside of a few specific things. Therefore, it is for you to announce the triggers on your beneficial effects and for your opponent then to follow them. Um... Otherwise, you know, you know, do you have to do something if someone doesn't say C and C? It's a good idea to just speed up the game and assume they will say it, but no, you technically don't, and that's up to you and, and how you want to play. Um, two final notes in this matter. If the floor judges had intervened at the time, it's possible they would have made a different determination from the one above. If this had been the case, we would generally have been inclined to support their findings and not overturn the decision. This is very important. Judges are empowered to make decisions on the day that resolve these conflicts. Um... It, it is not for LSS to come in and, and overrule judges, except in the most egregious of cases, after the effect. So judges feel should feel confident to make these decisions without chessing with that, checking with LSS. Um, the repeated rules infringements can lead to an escalation, escalating levels of sanctions. In the case of unsporting conduct, this can ultimately lead to a sanction, including disqualification and suspension. A formal warning is a permanent uh, record on a player's account and will be considered by the committee if a case involving the same player should come before the committee again in the future. Um... So what this is basically saying, and I think this is important to understand with like how this person is being punished. We have on record one actual rules infraction recorded on camera. Whether he made others at the table that weren't caught by judges because there wasn't an active judge on every table, none were reported by the by the um, opponents of this player to the judge. Therefore, they were not. They cannot be considered. Right? You need to have reported evidence. Um, if they had been reported, then maybe something else could have been done. Realistically, on the day, if a player makes a mistake like this in round one, they will be issued a warning, an IP penalty, or some other form of punishment, and potentially their trigger will be rolled back, right? So if I was sitting across from Matt Fawkes on that day, and I put up my hand and said, hey, judge, look, he just ticked that up, um, or judge, he did this, I said, okay, and now he's doing this, the judge probably would have resolved it that he didn't get his token, or and I don't get my token. Or I get my token because I allowed the same thing to him, and that was kind of an agreed shortcut that the tokens were going to be a bit, um, a bit unst you know, a bit flexible in the game. Um, but he would not have been DQ'd from the event for making a mistake like that fairly early on in the tournament, unless another mistake was caught later on that filled the same criteria. He wouldn't have been punished to that extent. So for LSS to retroactively come in and punish him to that extent is pro it would definitely be an overreach, right? Which is why I thought that this was never going to get. He was never going to get banned for this. He will just get some sort of a note. And it's important to understand to all the people saying, well, he cheated, he won, now he can freely cheat again. This person now has a formal warning on his account. So if a person did something like that in round one of a tournament and therefore got a benefit because of it, they would not get DQ'd. They might get an IP penalty. They might get a warning. Matt Fawkes, however, if he does that in round one of his next tournament... He is looking at a much larger penalty because he has a permanent warning on his account. 
Now, he's going to have to be very, very careful to play very cleanly at his next event and avoid any sort of things that are going to draw attention to him and give him a beneficial announcement. That is a very, very large sword of Damocles hanging over his head to make him play properly at the next tournament. It is also a big warning to other people saying that if you are playing at an event, you need to play cleanly because if you do not, you could end up with a warning like this if it's not caught by the judges at the event. If it is caught by the judges at the event, you could receive a penalty on the day. You could get your IP penalties, you could get things like that. So you do have to play cleanly. Um, but it's important that you can't, as LSS, go back and overreach um, when, you know, the tournament has run, 15 rounds were played, there are only a certain number of infractions noted, and those infractions would likely not have got a player disqualified from a tournament. You have to be um, ben balanced and perspective in this. You also then have to go on and support the actual judge teams to do a better job. Um, so they end off by saying, finally, we don't want to uh, the matter above to detract from what was otherwise a great event. The organisers and judges core did a great job running the tournament, and we are grateful for them for putting on such an outstanding event. Judges perform a critical and difficult role, often in trying circumstances, and we'd like to extend our gratitude to them for the contribution to the community via judging the event. Perfect. Yeah. Judges are fantastic. They volunteer their time that they could be using to win prizes. Remember, the head judge for the event is a very good player himself. Um, the level two judge who was the head judge at the event, he could probably have easily made the top 24, got 250 quid. He could have made the top eight, maybe got a couple thousand quid. He chose to judge instead. And there are lots of other good players um i've heard say that they weren't thinking about judging before but now they are because they care more about the um event being of a very high standard so it'll be interesting to see if that happens as well um and really i think this statement and this this controversy could actually be quite good for flesh and blood in the long run it's going to force judges to be a lot more um engaged aware hold themselves to a higher standard it's going to force the community to hold ourselves to a higher standard um, it's going to get people who weren't as invested in judging invested in judging. Um, it really is, you know, the, every new game struggles with this sort of controversy where judges are afraid of ruining people's weekends because they've previously been quite a tight-knit community. They don't want to ruin someone's weekend because of a mistake they made, so they're kind of lenient. But as you move into more professional events, you need to have that level of professional judging to come and match it. So really, we have a situation where these sorts of controversies, to be honest, from my perspective, having come from other games that have gone from community to competitive, was kind of pr predictable and expected um, and really you know what needs to happen now is what's happening there needs to be a respect of lss for the judges things need to tighten up to the stage where people can be held accountable for their actions and judges on the day just need to see things and apply appropriate penalties warnings ip2 penalties if someone has made a mistake in a game uh, you need to call your judge and you need to let them know because you don't know how many other times that's happened that tournament. You don't know how many other times people need, you know, how many other times people need to be um, addressed. You know, if your opponent, tr if your opponent tries to do a trigger against you, they can't do. You're better off just telling the judge because if they try and do it in the next game as well, then they do actually need to be punished. So they need to have a warning recorded against them for that. Um, right. Then let's go on to expectations of professional play. We would like to thank this take this opportunity to remind players about our expectations of players at professional tournament levels. National Championship events represent some of our highest levels of competition for flesh and blood and are ruled at a professional rules enforcement level. As such, we expect players to play hard and play fair. Flesh and blood is a game of skill and we expect players to win games and tournaments through skillful play in an honest and fair manner, not through exploitation of game rules, rule sharking or angle shooting to derive an unfair advantage. To be clear, this does not mean players are obliged to let their opponents take back mistakes once a play has been made. No one is saying that. We strongly emphasize, however, that players are expected to hold themselves to the same standard they hold their opponents to, which means if you are a sloppy player and you are asking for take backs a lot, your opponent should probably also be granted the same. And for you to deny them, that is really just holding them to a different standard and quite unfair according to the rules. Players should call judges to resolve disputes, clarify rules queries, and administer fixes to the game state. Judges are there to aid in the running of a tournament, administer corrections to games, aid in the smooth continuation of a game, and issue penalties where necessary. Penalties are used to discourage players from behaviour and to balance out advantages gained from particular actions. Players should not be afraid to call a judge for their own honest mistakes as well, as often there is no game-changing penalty administered if a fix can ensure the game state is corrected and a player doesn't gain advantage. When something goes wrong in a game at a professional level, event stick up your hand call a judge let them sort it out and they can also use that to track patterns and repeatedly 
you know, figure out what's happening with players and fix problems that occur repeatedly. We'd also remind players of the following general points. Always be clear when communicating your plays to your opponent, particularly with respect to triggers and priorities. Correct. Um, we encourage players to clearly announce things such as how much they are attacking for and defending for, any triggers, passing of priority, life total changes, and all other public information that could influence either player's decision. You may think that it is smart to get away with mis not misrepresenting the game state by not saying how much someone is attacking or defending for. However, there was a clear instance at the recent event where someone attacked with a Rosetta Thorn. Um, uh, someone said, I take four right, and the other player just said okay. And then the person took four when they should have only taken two. If both players announce how much you're attacking or defending for, it cleans up a lot of potential problems. Um, you should also just announce your triggers. Command and Conquer hits, therefore this happens. Snatch hits, therefore this happens. Um, it is very important to announce your triggers so that your opponent can A, respond to them if they wish to, B, make sure they actually resolve properly, um, and therefore the game progresses smoothly and the best player wins based on the cards they have. The play space, defined by the outline of both players' match, should be clear from instruction to preserve the integrity of physical communication and your gameplay. This includes oversized and or all non-game related objects. For the avoidance of doubt, the use of a die to represent the amount of resources you have remaining, ideally placed just above the pitch zone, is allowed and strongly encouraged. This means if you want to bring a big blue dice to remind yourself to trigger your tunic, don't. You are not allowed to obstruct the game um, state with things that do not track things that are happening in the game. Tracking your pitch is fine. Tracking counters on equipment is fine. Tracking something else is not fine. Also, a reminder that tokens should not be present in the game space. This is clearly stated in the tournament, rule, tournament rules and policy documents. Tokens such as Briars, Embodiments, Rune Chants, Spectral Shields and others may, must not be present if they are not in play. It is not acceptable to have these in the game space by default and then use a dice or move them to a different position to indicate when they are active or present. This thing just helps avoid so much confusion by just not having those cards on the table unless they are actually in play. Expectations of recorded games and community reporting. Streaming of matches is something that a huge benefit to the community as a whole, 100%. For those who can't attend an event, it provides an opportunity to avoid watching the matches and to learn more about the game as part of the global Flesh and Blood TCG community. Flesh and Blood is a complex game. Even at the highest levels of gameplay, players can still make mistakes. True. Nearly every single high-level player will be able to give you an example of a game rule mistake they've made at some point. In the vast majority of cases, missing of triggers or errors in gameplay procedure do not constitute unsporting conduct, rule sharding, rules sharking or cheating this is it is virtually inevitable that one player or another will benefit as a result of a mistake and that fact by itself does not mean that the misplay is in any way deliberate when watching coverage we encourage the community to understand when misplays inevitably occur on camera and then in the vast majority of cases they are honest mistakes and for the most part we should assume goodwill on behalf of the players involved this is very important so the judge guidelines say as a basic level you have to assume goodwill on behalf of the players involved obviously if there are repeat infractions you can reach the stage where you think someone might be cheating and you can punish them as um regarded but someone making one mistake or two or three mistakes on stream does not institute uh does not constitute a lack of goodwill um even though they should be punished for it because those mistakes may repeatedly benefit them right it's just important to understand that that's where lss are coming from and i think it's an important stance to have right people make mistakes i've made mistakes on stream um you know other people have made mistakes on stream typically you call a judge it gets sorted someone gets a warning please don't do that again if you make the same mistake repeatedly in a tournament the judge will be like come on here's a penalty you have to play better but really it is a penalty so you play better it's not a penalty because they think you're cheating and that's kind of i think important to understand we do not condone members of the community engaging in witch hunts or harassing bullying players in cases where they believe a rule has been broken we believe that a witch hunt culture resulting from scaling scrutiny of stream gameplay will ultimately leave players declining to play on stream because of a perceived risk. We would be a, this would be a, um, a major loss for the entire flesh and blood community. It is important to understand that everyone at the UK Nationals was given the opportunity to say no if they didn't want to be on stream. Um, it is very hard to stream someone, especially in the EU, if they do not want to be present on camera, um, as you have to get their um, their permission, basically, to put them live on camera. You can make it as part of um, the tournament entry requirements, but it's still very difficult. So really, ultimately, these witch hunts will dissuade people from playing on stream. Um, everyone makes mistakes on stream and otherwise. Um, a lot of people see a mistake and kind of go to the maximum level of penalties without realizing that if you read the penalties and punishments guidelines for the game, um, most of the common mistakes that happen in terms of games, rules, violations, etc., the punishment is a warning 
um, and a failure to maintain game state penalty for both players. Um, because both players are responsible for maintaining the game state. Uh, but obviously an especial warning for the person who actually made the mistake themselves. The appropriate way to report serious incidents that occurred in official events is emailing OP at FabTCG. People definitely do that. We'd also remind the community that while we support the rights of players to report potential instances of cheating, freely express their opinion, engage in ro robust debates, behaviour such as targeted bullying and harassment of players is not acceptable per the penalty guidelines document. Infractions resulting in suspension or banning do not need to have occurred inside an analysis event venue. LSS reserves the right to suspend players from LSS events for behaviour that is believed to have negatively impacted the flesh and blood community. They are basically saying that if they think that you are engaged in a serious witch hunt that negatively impacts the flesh and blood community, you could actually get a suspension yourself um for how you behave within the community right and that's kind of important to understand so do not feel that just because you are not at a tournament you have free reign to target people harass people or create negative experiences you do not um and let's understand the context here me saying i am not happy with the level of enforcement at that tournament i think that player cheated i think this is a mistake um i think something needs to be done that is not me going on a witch hunt that is not me harassing someone me messaging someone deliberately being like oh you're shit what did you do that for you're an idiot like all all this kind of stuff i hope you don't play the game again i hope you're terrible you know i hope you leave all that kind of stuff would be considered bullying right and it's important to understand that we can have a a lot of people congratulated me on this on my last video but i firmly believe it just you know because I come from a family of four, uh, of five uh, children, and you know, there's always fights that need to be resolved and things like that. Is that we can resolve our differences and express strong opinions about cheating, even whether a particular player has cheated or what a per particular person has done, without actually dropping to the level of harassing or bullying that person. Right? Um, we can we can talk about those things and even agree that someone has cheated without harassing or bullying the person who has cheated. Right? We can do all of those things as a community. It's not even particularly that difficult. You just talk about the instances that have occurred and you talk about the things that went wrong without actually using defamatory language or being aggressive towards the person themselves. And that's something I would encourage you all to consider as the future weeks go ahead because LSS have clearly put a fly flag post in the sand and said, look, we're not also going to tolerate you harassing people outside the flesh and blood uh, community. Retroactive investigations. Legend Story Studios will not, in the absence of exceptional circumstances, retroactively address instances if they have not been addressed by the t judges or TO at an event. Generally speaking, there would need to be compelling evidence of actions that could warrant a retroactive disqualification for an investigation to be opened. The primary purpose of the penalty guidelines community is to investigate instances where a player has been disqualified from a professional level event. Generally, what they're saying is that this is kind of on their level, but also kind of not on their level. They're kind of saying that if a judge has chosen not to do something about something at an event, they're not usually going to step in and, and start making decisions on behalf of that judge. They're saying there would need to be compelling evidence that there something else needs to change. There need to be compelling evidence that things weren't ruled properly on the day, etc., 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 for them to get involved. So they're kind of setting the scene that they aren't really going to be involved every time something goes wrong at an event, that they're going to leave it up to the judges and the TOs at the event to resolve. Maybe if they haven't resolved it and people think it's super serious, they'll get involved. And that's definitely the correct result because judges and TOs need to have the power to make these decisions and run their events smoothly. LSS can't be seen as the necessary arbiter for all of these things because a lot of the times they will be on a different time zone and will not be able to respond in a timely manner a judge needs to have the power to keep their event going because as i said in a video um i think a couple months ago talking about how you should to and judge events and some advice keeping your event going with the highest level of you know quality you can imagine you can manage is the main goal of a judge right if that means you have to make a ruling on an edge rule that lss hasn't decided on yet that's never come up before and isn't in any of the guidelines just to keep the tournament running you do it and then you come back with that knowledge to lss and say hey i ruled it this way um because it wasn't in the um in any of the documents are you happy with that if not can you amend the documents so they change the documents after the fact you don't stop the whole tournament until you can get on the phone with new zealand and it's important to understand the judges and materials are empowered to be the arbiters of their event and to keep the event going and if this had been dealt with on the day, I guarantee you that LSS would have put, put out nothing about it, 
right? If he had gotten a warning for that first um, instance of gameplay or a bigger penalty, if he'd been caught doing it later, he would not have been given, he, he would not have had this response. It would have been deemed as handled on the day and it would not have been followed up on by LSS, right? The penalty guidelines. We have always been consistent in stating that we view our rules documents, including the penalty guidelines, as living documents. But we up, will be updated or ident when we identify changes or updates that need to be made. During the investigation process, we noted there were several areas that could be involved, particularly those that could be improved or clarified, particularly re those relating to unsportsmanlike conduct or rule sharking. We will be reviewing those sections as well as the penalty guidelines generally more fully at the conclusion of the current national championship season to ensure they are fit for purpose and expect there may be some changes to the current wording or sections as a result of this. So let's just sort of wrap up by talking about this. LSS have 100% done the right thing in this situation. They've come out with a very strong statement basically saying this is what went wrong. We judge this person... Um, we judge this person, you know, harshly. They're being given a permanent, uh, a permanent formal warning for this this comment of play. And if they do it again at another event, obviously they're going to be held um, more harshly on this matter. Um, you know, and you know, this is the level that which we're going to deal with this. This is the level we expect people to play at. And they get they, they're kind of empowering judges to enforce people's own rules upon themselves so if you allow something to happen they're kind of saying to judges well they allowed it to happen so you're perfectly entitled to allow the other player to get away with it which actually does change how that ruling would have been ha would have been handled if a judge had walked to the table right so if i had walked to the table that i had seen uh, i'm not a judge by the way i should say that i uh did the level one judge exam i got 80 percent um i misread two cards because i probably did it too quickly um so i'm not currently a level one judge but i will redo the exam i guess in december and i should get over 80 percent um i didn't find any of the questions too difficult i just rushed a little bit and misread one or two of them and therefore didn't get the full answers i was supposed to get um um, I encourage anyone to do the judge test if you want to. I mean, we need more judges. Uh, we need more people who know the game, um, understanding how to judge um, and run run large tournaments. And obviously, if you're interested in judging, you should do it. You know, if if this whole si it's kind of interesting. Just to pause for a second from the other discussion, if this whole thing has made you rage about how the rules were implemented and why didn't that active judge catch it on the day and all that other kind of stuff, that's kind of a sign that you care a lot about the rules being enforced and you should probably think about being a judge, right? You know, if you keep looking at what's happened and been like, why, why didn't the judge catch that? Why wasn't this caught? You know, all those sorts of things. It's probably a sign that you care about judging and you should maybe try and get involved in that part of the game. Anyway, as I've said, this is important. LSS saw the problem, responded to it very quickly, um, did a review of the situation, and most importantly, got it out before the next major tournament. So this had to come out before the US Nationals, and also gave a lot of clear guidance on how they expect the game to be played, how they expect judges to rule these kind of issues, and how they expect the tournament to um, you know, the tournament to be held and really practical things that are going to help the running of the next event. So I'm actually very, very happy with this response. Um, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of people are going to say, um, you know, a lot of people are going to say that he should have been punished harsher, all of this other kind of stuff. And really, I, I genuinely don't agree. Um, You know, I, I genuinely don't agree. Uh, I think, as I say, I think if these things have been caught on the day, he, um, you know, he he would have not been not been um, punished in the way that he should have been punished. I mean, it doesn't help that he puts out tweets like "I lied to a judge and deserve to be banned a hundred percent." Like he 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 needs to think about how he's presenting himself to the community if he cares. Um, but I hope you know he does care. Um, yeah, yeah. It's kind of annoying and a bit upsetting that this happened, um, you know, at the first Nationals. I would have liked the UK Nationals to have gone quite smooth. But then equally, as I said before, like, this is kind of predictable. Um, you know, first large national event happens in a country where the game has been out for less than a year. Most players have been playing for like four or five months. This kind of thing is kind of, it's just pretty much expected. Um, and I definitely sort of expected there would be some controversy at this event. Um, I've never successfully seen an event go from competitive, from like casual local store gameplay to professional level competitive gameplay uh, without these sorts of mistakes. Um, and obviously there's going to be people who try and capitalize on that, who are very good at the rules and therefore um, try and 
take advantage of the fact that this um the judges are inexperienced and the players are inexperienced at the moment um but whether or not that happens it's very hard to spot all i will say is for people looking at this and worrying um as the game gets more developed as the game gets more established um these sorts of situations will happen less and less and less um until we reach a point where we do have you know multiple level two and level three judges in the uk are all happy and capable of actively judging a table and spotting every single mistake that will come you know, if we get a calling in the UK in next in the next year or so, it will happen. There will be multiple level two judges there. There will be level two judges actively watching the stream table. More of these mistakes will be caught. We can literally only go up from here. And it's important that LSS is understanding that. And whilst they are making people have warnings and, and, and putting up red flags and showing things that they don't think are acceptable, they're not overreacting and shutting people down hard at this stage in the game for what are you know mistakes that people will make and because because really let's think about the focus of the game at the moment the focus of the game is to get as many people involved in the game as possible and that isn't what happens when you ban the person who wins the national championships because you invalidate a whole weekend of competitive gameplay for everyone involved it's not what happens people feel much more negative about it if you have to show that you're enforcing the rules and you're holding people to a high standard and you have to make sure you're clearly communicating what that standard is but you can't also just go around and retroactively just be like well that tournament didn't count that tournament didn't count ban this person ban that person because eventually it just leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth right so you kind of have to be careful how you deal with these kind of things and i think they have been um, but, you know, obviously at the US Nationals, I expect to see proper rules enforcement for mistakes, both on stream and off stream. And I think that judges are empowered to do that. Anyway, if you have listened to all of this video, congratulations. You could have read the article yourself, but you decided you wanted to hear me talk about it. And I think that is a great decision. Um, and because of that, I think you should definitely like and subscribe this video because you are clearly very, very keen on my opinion and very, very interested in hearing it. Um, in terms of other updates from the channel, I will be coming out with some more deck techs, um, both before and after the US event, uh, for interesting decks that I'm trying out and I think that are cool. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you all for watching. Uh, I hope you found my take on this quite interesting. Let me know if you agree or disagree with me in the comments below. Thanks and have a nice day.